Well, good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Venice Presbyterian Church. We are so excited that you are here with us today in worship. On next Sunday, we look forward to a very special, special event. Our senior pastor returns. And at 4 o'clock next Sunday, September 2nd, we welcome, for the first time as our associate pastor, Carolyn Wilson. And her ordination will be next Sunday at 4 p.m. And we invite you all to come back for this wonderful moment uh, in the life of our church. At the children's desk in the narthex, you will see these sheets. These are calendars for the Venice Elementary School. And it's a prayer, prayer, prayer guide. And every day in September and October, you get to cover the principals, the teachers, the children in prayer. So I would challenge you to really grab one of these and add this to your prayer life each day. In your pews, you will notice our new concert series bulletin is out. I'm telling you, this is not a season you want to miss. We are starting with a great Christmas concert and ending with, for the first time in Venice, Canadian Brass will be joining us. So this is going to be a very exciting season. Finally, Adeline, your garage door opener is at the welcome desk. <laughs> All right? In our mainstream denominations, we have always referred to the opening lines of worship to be the call to worship. In many African American traditions, what we call this part of the service is devotions. We commonly know devotions to be our time with God during the week. However, in the African American church, this was a time of testimony, a time of scripture reading and singing before the service begins. So in the African American church, we prepare our hearts by, with worship by clapping, by stomping, by shouting, by kissing our brother and sister with a holy kiss, which I won't ask you to do this morning. But that's how we begin our service every Sunday. So our devotional scripture, or our call to worship this morning, is from Ephesians 6. And it says, put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the word, world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of, of the evil one, and take that helmet of salvation, and that sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. I said, can I get an amen? amen? So after the scripture read, the deacon would start singing a song. And one of the songs he would sing would go something like this. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. Promise him that I will serve him till I die. I won the battlefield for my Lord. I was all on an idol. I was a sinner too. I heard a voice from heaven. So there is work to do. And I took the master's hand. And I joined the Christian man.
something that good happened in their life this week. So for me, I get to see my fiance every day. So that's a blessing in disguise. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. Hear the words of the psalmist. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Every voice in sing, and it is affectionately referred to as the Black National Anthem. In 1899, a young poet and school principal named James Weldon Johnson was asked to address a crowd in Jacksonville, Florida, for the coming anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Two, de two decades had passed since the Reconstruction era, and lynchings were on the rise in the segregated South. Instead of preparing an ordinary speech, Johnson decided to write a poem. He began with a simple but powerful line, a call to action, lift every voice and sing. After finishing each stanza in ordinary, after he handed over the lyrics to his classically trained brother, John Rosamon Johnson, who put the words to music. As he wrote the words, ev evoking the struggle and resilience of his ancestors, he began to weep. In a book, he said, I couldn't hold back the tears, and I made no effort to do so. The following year, a chorus of 500 school children performed the song at the Lincoln Celebration. The song 
quickly took off, becoming a rallying cry for the black communities in the South, or as one observer noted at the time, a collective prayer. It was embraced as a hymn in churches and performed at graduation ceremonies and in school assemblies. Within 20 years, the NAACP adopted Lift Every Voice and Sing as its official song. For generations to come, it would be known widely as the Black National Anthem. So I'd invite you to stand and sing this great hymn. As this song is new to many of you, I would invite you to turn in your hymnals to hymn 563.
caring and compassionate God. We gather to worship and find rest in your holy presence. We lift up the things that trouble our hearts today. Allow us to slow down and breathe in your spirit. and Reconnect with you. May your grace and peace touch our lives and provide that needed rest. Father, we know people who are dealing with illness and pain and are in need of your healing presence. And for them we pray. May your grace and peace touch their lives and provide for them needed rest. We know people who are fearful of what the future holds, possibilities of unemployment, failure, loss of financial security, health, and for them we pray. May your grace and peace touch their lives and provide for them needed rest. Lord, as we do the work you've called us to do, your Holy Spirit works through us. We tire, and your presence embraces us, refreshes us, transforms us, and we go forth filled with your grace and love, empowered anew to life and service in your name. We pray these things in the name of the one who has showed us the incredible joy and power of life lived in and for Jesus Christ. In one voice we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we do every Sunday or very often we sing a what we call in the service a prayer and song. And this is very true of, of the African American church. We sing a song after we unite our voices in the prayers of the people and the Lord's Prayer. This morning we sing the great spiritual precious Lord take my hand, which was not written by Elvis Presley. This song was written by Thomas Dorsey, one of the greatest spiritual writers known to man in 1932. This great spiritual and song of prayer was a refuge to Dr. King during the Civil Rights Movement. In times of distress, he would call a woman by the name of Mahalia Jackson. Mahalia Jackson was one of the greatest gospel singers this world has ever seen. And she would sing, Precious Lord, to Dr. King over the phone in times of distress. This spiritual set the making of I Have a Dream speech. Dr. King wrestled with the concept of giving this speech. And in his conversation with Mahalia Jackson, he said, I think I'm going to go another way. And she exhorted, tell them the dream, Martin. And then she sang the song to him. And I invite you to sing it with me. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me
prophet Malachi said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, there will not be room enough for it. Anyone who has tested God in this, as I have, has found that it is impossible to outgive God. It is a reality in Jesus' upside-down kingdom that it is more blessed to give than to receive. When we give to God, we are not spending our money. We are making an investment in the eternity that we will all be living in one day. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness, and we thank you that we can always trust in you. We give you this offering today as we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen.
me catch my breath. <laughs> so we've got two more pieces before the message, and the title of this is Negro Spirituals, the foundation of black church music. Negro Spirituals are what gave the black church its music. When we think and hear spirituals, we often hear songs about bondage or songs about looking towards the promised land. And that's what shaped the theology of the black church for a hundred years. From the time of slavery to the time of civil rights is our promised land was waiting. The promised land of freedom. During the time of slavery, the promised land of being at rest with Jesus from the turmoils of their life. How many here, by a show of hands, know the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Dietrich Bonhoeffer spent about a year and a half in New York City. He was a fellow at Union Theological Seminary. Do you know what he did during his time in New York? He spent a year and a half teaching Sunday school at an all-black church. Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, New York is the pinnacle, quintessential, most famous African-American church there is in the country. During this time, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's theology and faith was shaped the first time he heard the spiritual. The spirituals helped shape his theology and faith with Nazi Germany. For me, the African American church and its music has shaped my faith. What I'm getting at is there is one faith, there is one Lord, and there is one church. And see, when we get to heaven, there's going to be a lot more of me there than there are in this room right now. (laughs) You got it. (laughs) But the spirituals cross all races. Because the spiritual is nothing but the gospel. And the gospel is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is here. The death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is the gospel. That's what unites us, one faith, one Lord, one church. We are his new creation. What does the hymn say? The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that I am a bride of Christ. And so as we sing these spirituals, this is not just my heart. This is not just the heart of the African American people, but this is the heart of Jesus Christ.
Wasn't it a pity and a shame? And he never said a mumble in a word. Wasn't it a pity and a shame? And he never said a mumble in a word. Came trickling it on, and he never said a mumbling word. His blood came trickling it on, and he never said a mumbling word. Not.
listen to you all day. <clears throat> I stand before you a little bit in fear and trembling now because the message that um, this morning is about a sensitive and a complex issue, and that is racism. In no way do I pretend to be an expert. I'm just learning about the nuances and complexities involved in this controversial subject, and in fact, I've learned more this year than I had before in my whole life. My purpose today is twofold. One is to shed more light on the problem, because I think um, a lot of times we don't really, um, as white middle class people, we don't really understand the depth of it. And then two, to show that as Christians, there are simple things that we can do to be part of the solution as we obey our Lord's command to love one another. So I humbly ask for your grace and that you listen with a heart of compassion. But first of all, let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear now the word of God from the first epistle of John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. And now here is our central verse. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters, are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And then the Apostle John concludes this section with, The commandment we have from him is this, Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is the word of the Lord. On August 28, 1963, 55 years ago this coming Tuesday, at a march on Washington for jobs and freedom, Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his historic speech, I Have a Dream. What he was asking for was the rights which are guaranteed for all people in the Constitution of the United States of America be given to blacks as well as to whites. He was seeking an end to segregation, unfair voting laws, police brutality, exclusion of blacks in places of lodging, in neighborhoods, in public places that bore signs that said for whites only. Often quoting scripture, he urged people to continue protesting and pressing for their rights 
always, always in nonviolent ways. He said, in the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. He told his listeners, continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. I have a dream, he said. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream, he said, that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He closed with these words. When we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. He was assassinated five years later on April 4th, 1968. So um, where are we today? We see our errors so much more clearly in hindsight, don't we? It's hard to believe that someone had to ask for human, uh, equal human rights for um, human beings. So how have we done in the 55 years that have transpired since that historic speech? What kind of progress have we made? I am white and middle class and have personally seldom been exposed to racism or maybe have not recognized it when I saw it. I grew up believing that the police are my friends and will help me if I am lost or get in trouble. I thought that we had agreed as a nation that everyone was equal, so it should be a done deal, right? We should just go forward. Whatever the past was, let's just go forward, and everybody's equal. Everybody is treated fairly. Well, my eyes were open to the continuing existence of significant racism through various experiences, particularly in my seminary mission immersion trip to Madison, Wisconsin in January of this year. The research for this sermon opened my eyes even more. There are two kinds of racism, actually, institutional racism and individual racism. Institutional racism includes laws, political and societal structures that have discrimination built into them. We have made significant progress in reducing institutional racism. No more for whites only signs, no more redlining of neighborhoods, and it is illegal to discriminate against anyone based on race. However, institutional racism does still exist. A 2017 report that was a result of a survey conducted for the National Public Radio, the Robert Wood Foundation, and Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health states that 50% of African Americans say they have personally been discriminated against because they are black when interacting with the police. 56% when applying for jobs, 57% when it comes to being paid equally or being considered for promotion, 60% of African Americans say they or a family member have been unfairly stopped or treated by the police because they are black, and 45% say the court system has treated them unfairly because they are black. Blacks living in suburban areas are more likely than those in urban areas to report being unfairly stopped or treated by the police and being threatened or harassed because they are black. The more insidious kind of racism, though, is individual racism because it is deeply rooted in the human heart. That same report states that 51% of African Americans have personally experienced racial slurs, 
52% have experienced people making negative assumptions or insensitive or offensive comments about their race. 42% have experienced some form of racial violence. And interestingly, higher income black Americans are more likely to report these experiences. Did you know that the Ku Klux Klan is alive and well? Though their numbers are smaller now, they're trying to grow. Just this month, USA Today reported that in an upstate New York community, the Klan is recruiting children by placing baggies with their recruitment posters and candy inside of them. And between four and six in the morning, they go and drop these at the, at, at the end of driveways where children will be sure to pass them when they're on their way to school. They're, and they're targeting poorer neighborhoods, such as trailer parks in particular. Cedric Dale Horde is a Christian poet, writer, speaker, and therapist. I heard him perform a reading of one of his poems in Madison, Wisconsin, at a Martin Luther King Jr. celebration on January 16th this year. In his introduction to this reading, he told about a little eight-year-old black boy in a church youth group that he was working with, who said to him, Cedric, I wish I wasn't born black. Can you imagine? Racism has a devastating effect on children. It breaks my heart, and I hope it breaks yours too. The poem we're about to hear by Cedric is entitled Shooting Stars, A Letter to Black Boys. It is about how black boys generally believe that the only way to excel is through sports or rap music, and he is encouraging them to widen their horizons. It speaks to the deep psychological effect that centuries of discrimination have carved into the psyche of black boys. I was blown away by this reading, and I really want to share it with you. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me and before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. And go home to my Lord and be free. I heard a man on TV once ask, Why do all young black boys aspire to be rappers and athletes and not aspire to be astronauts? Well, sir. Maybe because the limits around them have made their space so small that the only idea of shooting for the stars consists of orbiting a ball into a ring. The only way they could ever accomplish a moonwalk had to be a dance move. Or maybe if they could move like the speed of light to the end zone before the other team collides into them like asteroids, then maybe, then maybe they can become a star. See, America preaches that the sky is the limit, but why does it seem like entertainment is the only way for us to soar? So we are taught that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, but why does it seem like the only thing that is evident is the problems that we could see? From the scenes on the TV screens that tell us that life is not so serene, sometimes I wonder how could they ever believe that 2,000 years ago a man shed his blood just to purchase them, but yet we live in the 2000s and all they see is the blood shed in Ferguson. See, I understand that the uncertainty burdens them, burdens some thoughts like do cops protect or do they just murder them? See, giving them hope is like putting a band-aid on a gunshot. Yes, we acknowledge that they're hurting. But the correct remedy is never applied to the pain that they're feeling, so they go through life wounded, but never find healing. But you tell me, 
how do we heal hard hearts haunted by hatred and convince them that they're still gonna make it like even though your worth in society has been degraded you're still blessed by the greatest even though our history keeps rewriting the pages that say your skin will be the only basis for a society deems you as heinous see i'm tired of young black men suddenly becoming famous after their life has been taken so i have to take out the time to tell them this i want them to know that they can break down stereotypes like they think we can break down defenders like our life is more than just ankle breakers and house arrest straps worn as ankle bracelets i want to tell them that it's okay to think that calling each other the n-word is absurd because we prefer to be referred to as sirs no more identity being blurred with a word that was meant to disturb i want to tell them that i don't fear being hand cuffed because the one i fear has me cuffed in his hands i want to tell them that when i call my woman my rib that signifies her more than being a piece of meat but signifies her being by my side she is more than a chick on the side no b word whole baby mama but she will be my pride i want to tell them that their walk with god is more important than the shoes that they walk in and the designer's name under your souls mean nothing if our designer's name is not over your soul i want to tell them that the only time they will raise their hand in the air will be to answer a question in the classroom i want to tell them that maybe people will not look at you as sinners and more like saints when they realize that jesus didn't look like those pictures society paints i want to tell them that even though they think you can only shoot baskets or only shoot guns and not go far i want them to know that they can shoot for the stars i want to tell them that you are more than prison bars or rapping bars but i think you can reach bar exams you are far advanced i want to tell them that yes your life matters and that goes beyond the hashtag but that was on your tag when god purchased you and yes I am aware of an institutional racism, discrimination, prejudice, stereotypes, and microaggressions. But I also know that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Unfortunately, barriers are in my way, but no barriers are in my mind. See, this poem may not cause a revolution or even be a solution, but at least you will know that you are a contribution. And I have to remind myself that my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was probably handed one of the most unfair verdicts in history, and the crime he supported supposedly committed seem like a mystery however god has a history of transforming misery into victory see despite what seemingly looked like a tragedy it was actually god's strategy to showcase his majesty how he has the vital capacity to still bring beauty even in the midst of depravity see he was hanging and beaten just like my ancestors who willingly sacrificed their life for rights so that I could walk safely at night for rights they couldn't possess the first time because they weren't born white and for rights so that I may ultimately live a better life than just like Christ. God can make things that are common become legends just to show us his glory and God's glory was manifested even in the face of injustice and we have to remember that God is still in justice. See, God is the perfect judge and he will continue to judge perfectly and I have to have the faith to believe that there is still purpose even in uncertainty and one day, yes one day we will all be free. So to that gentleman on TV, we may not all aspire to be astronauts, but at least we are all shooting for the stars. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm
I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. part of the solution to racism. There is no easy solution. It's not going to happen overnight. There's no simple way to everything always being completely equal. But there are simple things that each of us can do so that we can be part of the solution, so that God can use us. We can embody the teaching of Jesus to love all our brothers and sisters and be role models, salt and light, that our culture needs. There is a list of 10 simple ideas to eliminate racism, courtesy of the Cleveland area YWCA out in the narthex. If you're interested, you can pick up a copy on your way out. Um, and it includes things like not laughing at racist and other stereotypical jokes and slurs, educating ourselves. It is it's just amazing when you really dig into it, what you will learn making an effort to get to know people that are different than ourselves, putting ourselves in places where we are the minority. We can all do at least one or two of the things on that list. But even before we attempt to do that, God has given us clear foundational instruction. First, we can see every single person is made in the image of God. Genesis 1.27 says, so God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. It doesn't say he created white people in his image. It says the whole human family. Second, we can remember that only love can overcome hate. Paraphrasing Dr. King, that may mean absorbing some hate ourselves and not passing it on, but rather overcoming evil with good, returning a, a blessing for a curse. Third, Jesus clearly stated that we can do nothing without him. We can't even love our own family and friends sac sacrificially the way Jesus loves and loved us without the Holy Spirit loving them through us. Similarly, we can't expect that we will overcome the deeply rooted evil of racism outside of the power of God. We must depend on the Holy Spirit. I have a dream today, said Dr. King, quoting the prophet Isaiah. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall, shall see it together. May it be so. In the meantime, let's go be salt and light.
today, serve the Lord with excitement. It doesn't matter our culture, doesn't matter our ethnicity, doesn't matter where we come from, we are the body of Christ. We are the people in which Jesus gave his life for. So we have a reason to shout amen, right? We have a reason to shout amen, right? So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. And may the God that we serve give you his peace from this day until you meet him face to face. Can the church say amen? Amen. Amen again. Amen. 